All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Specifying Practice Group webinar. Our topic for today is part two of our editing master specifications topic. And our thought leaders are Dave Stutzman and Lewis Metcalf. <coughs> Dave, is a <coughs> pardon me. Dave is a registered architect, certified construction specifier, and founding principal of CSPEC, a specifications and quality assurance consulting firm. Lewis is an architect and certified construction specifier. Lewis is a senior quality manager for Gresham Smith and Partners, a national architecture, engineering, interiors, and planning firm. And a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Your participation during today's webinar is encouraged, and we have allowed time to take questions throughout the presentation. Although if any audio lines are muted, you may click the raise hand button at any time to indicate that you have a question or comment. We'll identify you by name and unmute your line, at which point you may begin speaking. If you're participating via streaming audio and do not have a computer microphone, you may also type your question into the chat box. And now, Dave and Lewis, over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Lewis speaking to you from Nashville, and uh, Dave talking to you from New Jersey. Um, we're going to wrap up this presentation that we started last month on editing master specifications, that is, the uh, published type of specifications that you can buy from uh, master spec, from RCOM, from eSpec, and uh, I mean, I'm sorry, eSpec is just a, a method of using master spec, uh, spec text, uh, BSD spec link, and some of the other published master specification systems. And so uh, we got most of the way through the presentation last month, but uh, I thought we would do just to have a quickie uh, reminder. We talked about uh, David discussed why specification masters are the way they are. David wrote, <coughs> was the primary author for spec text for m many years, and we talked about how they tried to be all things to all projects, uh, try to cover a wide range of, of projects from public projects where you, you may need to have very open specs and might not even be able to allow, uh, allowed to list any names at all to, um, for products to uh, very small projects where you can name a single proprietary product and have a closed spec. Uh, the, similarly, the spec masters have to be prepared for very complex projects like hospitals, high-rise buildings, airports, as well as uh, being able to be edited down for smaller buildings such as a, a branch bank or a, a one-story retail off building or shell and core office buildings, tenant improvements even, interior projects. The, uh, then two of the spec masters usually have uh, paragraphs that are appropriate for the different types uh, methods of specifying, descriptive, reference, performance, and proprietary. And so in all these cases, we need to think about what does my project need right now in terms of the level of detail, in terms of the complexity, and in terms of the basic approach to how uh, we're specifying the products. Uh, then we went on a little bit more about some of the common pitfalls because since these spec masters include so many um, things for very large and complex projects, a lot of these things such as uh, testing requirements and uh, excessive submittals, uh, pre-installation meetings, and so forth that might be needed for a very big or complex project are overkill for a lot of small projects. So again, we have to adjust that level of detail. And uh, David uh, suggested that uh, when in doubt, leave it out. One of the problems that folks you do when they have when they use master spec and are not really familiar with it and some of the other systems is that if they don't understand a given requirement, there is a strong temptation, which uh, I gave in to myself back when I started using Master Spec in 1982, to uh, leave in the stuff that you don't understand, hoping that it will be somehow necessary or helpful. But in fact, you're probably better off to go ahead and delete the things. Uh, that's now, not just. 
Lewis. Go ahead, David. Just, now, just to make sure that nobody understands that you're so much younger than I am, 1982 <laughs> is not when you first got out of school. No, that's true. That's <laughs> that's true. I've got a few years on on David. Actually, I finished up school in 1971. So, <laughs> um, and so we need to adjust it. So, where do we start? We we talked last. A month about <clears throat> part two and how it's always best to start uh, every spec section in part two. That um, if you have a clear first, if you edit part two down to figure out exactly what products you're going to be specifying, go on to part three uh, and get the right installation requirements and so forth. Then when you go back to part one, the administrative requirements, like what submittals do I need, and so forth, will make a lot of sense. So we uh, we worked through part two and talked about when do we need delegated design and when is that kind of overkill. And uh, we're ready to start on part three. So David, if you will advance us through there we go the slides. Oh, how about that? All right. Okay. In part three. Uh, there's an article for field quality control testing. And the question is, when do I need that stuff? And how much of that do I need? Well, obviously, if there are critical safety items, things that affect either life safety for the occupants of the, of the facility or the strength and stability of the construction itself, those things need to be tested. Uh, but again, there again, there may be a difference between the testing that you want for um, a very large building as opposed to a, uh, a small one-story building like a branch library. Right. And Lewis, you know, I find that this is a, a subject that varies greatly depending upon our clients because I have some that virtually do no field quality control testing, and I have others that want nearly everything that's possible to be tested so that they can confirm that they actually are getting what they bargained for. Now, are you talking about the, uh, when you say client, do you mean the actual facility owner of the project, or are you talking about your uh, writing specs for one of your AE clients? One of the architectural clients. So it, it varies greatly among the architects as to how they approach this. One of the things that can happen is that you get excessive uh, it's very easy to slip into the habit of uh, specifying ex excessive testing requirements for small, simple projects. And I think last time I told a war story about um, we had a project here, and one of the young uh, architects had edited the specs, and there was a lot of testing in it. And the developer of the project, the owner, uh, was in all uh, developers. This was for a speculative uh, suburban office building. Uh, complained that his testing uh, proposal from the uh, agent test agency was about twice what he was used to paying for most of his projects. And so uh, my job, one of the first th things that I did when I uh, came to my new firm here, was to go through the specs and help uh, the project team decide what testing was really needed and what we could live without. And so we went through and cut it about in half and got it down to a more reasonable level. Another thing that you may want, uh, another category of products that you may want to consider uh, field quality control testing for are site fabricated products, such as tilt-up concrete wall panels where where the the contractor is actually manufacturing the stuff on site and we're certainly going to need more quality assurance for those kinds of endeavors than uh, when we're just picking things out of a box and screwing them onto the uh, screw attaching it to the to the uh, basic structure right. and then and 
And there's, Go ahead. Al there's always the ones that you absolutely cannot get away from, and that's the code required special inspections. Yes, and then, of course that's related to those critical safety items. Right. And and those actually should probably be in in most cases are collected in a different location. They're usually gathered together in a one of the upfront sections so that they're all together and the the uh, code officials can verify that uh, you've thought of everything without having to plow through dozens of spec sections. Is that a new division you invented? The upfront <laughs> section? Well, I said that because some people put it in Division 1 and some people put it in the Series 0 documents. Uh, opinion is divided. <laughs> we'll, have to talk, we'll have to talk about that. But the last one that I would talk a uh, category where you may want to consider field quality control testing is to look at is for <clears throat> the critical performances specified in Part 2. But here again, we need to adjust the, uh, that to the level of uh, importance, level of complexity. If you're doing a one or two story building with uh, storefront framing on the first floor and maybe strip windows on the second floor made out of storefront, the amount of testing that you do on the installed windows may be very little or even none at all, uh, relying on uh, the uh, manufacturer's uh, general testing. But on the other hand, if you're doing a uh, 20 or 30 story high rise building, you're certainly going to want some uh, specific uh, testing for the curtain wall assemblies to make sure that they don't leak either air or water and that they're performing the way they're supposed to. So from there we're going to go now back to part one, now that we've finished parts two and parts three, we're going to slip over to uh, part one, and David's going to tell us about how to edit down spec masters for that portion of the spec section. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now you get to pick on me. All right. Uh, I find that we have a real divided opinion among the architects as to what to do with submittals. Uh, th and the comment I made about the field testing is it's a very similar situation where there are some that want very few submittals and there are some that want uh, a submittal for absolutely everything. Uh, and, I, and I'm just finishing up a project today which is one of those uh, clients, architects, that insists on a submittal for absolutely everything and takes, in my opinion, submittals to an absolute extreme. How in the world they find their fee to cover it during CA is beyond me. Uh, <laughs> but they managed to do that, I guess. So what I, what I like to see in the submittals is really enough to confirm that what the contractor is, or what is specified is actually being furnished by the contractor. And if I can convince the contractor to actually buy what is specified, I'd be happy to not see any product submittal unless it's for color selection or texture selection or if it's uh, fabricated to size to fit project requirements. So we'd actually write it to try to forgive the contractor going through the process of submittals if they can tell us that they're actually providing what is specified. So I try to tailor the submittals actually uh, very tightly so that we can have the architects spending their time where they really need to be uh, to make sure that the owner is getting what they've paid for. So my submittals articles are usually fairly light, except when clients demand otherwise. And I still um, resist that pretty strongly, but usually end up losing out on that fight. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sympathetic with that. I'm, my, uh, I'm always surprised at uh, the, I, the interior designers who want to have verification samples for everything that's already on their presentation boards. But uh, that's, uh, yeah, and that's that's fairly common. And I'm not sure why that is. If if the contractor submits it and says, "Okay, here's the product that we bought. Here's the model number. Here's the color. Here's the style," 
it matches exactly what's on your finish board, do I really need to submit a sample? It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, the qualifications requirements, though, I believe is well, uh, something. But before we leave submittals, though, we do need to think about when, after having gone through part two and uh, and looked at specified the products, we do need to think about now: are there appearance attributes that need to be selected in the submittals process, or have all is everything been specified? Uh, you know. If we're specifying carpet, has the specify the ID person given us the not only the manufacturer and the line of carpet, but the exact uh, color blend or pattern, or is that something that's going to be selected during the submittals process? So that's something right. that and needs to be thought about. Right, and for the architectural element, certainly, if it's an aesthetic concern, you want to be able to see those submittals, and you, you want to ask for the submittals that are required to be able to make the decision to be able to select those final products. I'm not suggesting that you try to do projects without submittals at all. Uh, I think that certainly you're going to have uh, those submittals where the decisions cannot be made before the project is actually put out for bid and for construction. Um, I see that uh, we have a comment from uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick. Uh, Rob, would you read that for us? Certainly, absolutely. Uh, just reading this, he says, uh, I graduated in 1983, and I agree that the spec writer needs to, re needs to remove if, if there's doubt, because the question was raised about what is the requirement uh, referenced uh, to a standard. Says, the spec writer and I were in a meeting with the owner and the contractor, and she did not know what the standard was about. The worst thing with the contractor did know. It's very, very embarrassing when that happens. <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah, it behooves us to do do our homework, gang. But, you know, I I had uh, five sons, and uh, when they were growing up, I used to tell them over and over, never use a word unless you are really sure you know what it means. And uh, I think that's a pretty good rule for life is don't put something in the specs that you don't understand. And if you need to understand it, do the homework and do that and, uh, and figure out what it is. Okay, let's talk about qualification requirements. All right. <clears throat> I think that the qualifications uh, usually end up applying to the, uh, the installer, uh, could be a fabricator, uh, could be a testing lab if it's a lab furnished by the contractor, could be engineer uh, if we're assigning delegated design. And I think that those qualification requirements are something that need to be carefully considered. Uh, many states that I've run into especially if you're doing publicly bid projects, don't re uh, allow years experience as a way of setting qualifications. So what I find myself doing is looking at uh, things where I'll pick on steel studs are the manufacturers members of steel stud manufacturers association because belonging to the association requires them to comply with the association code of ethics, requires them to comply with the association standards. And third, gives party, you some, third party testing. Right. Gives you some level of confidence that at least they're producing something that does actually comply with the industry standard even if you're not specifying it by an ASTM standard. So there's there's that level of confidence that you can build by relying on some of the professional and manufacturers associations and and many of them have just excellent requirements and they actually have ways to enforce it. One of the ones that comes to mind is like uh, architectural woodwork uh, associations, AWI, WI, and the Canadian equivalent. Uh, they actually monitor and will go out and visit sites uh, to make sure that the installation complies with their standards requirements. So from that standpoint, I think if the project is going to warrant uh, that kind of oversight, certainly we can rely on these qualification statements. The, the masters 
often require some very specific uh, qualifications and sometimes end up requiring multiple qualifications. One that I can think that has presented problems to some of our clients is in structural steel where there are fabricator qualifications and erector qualifications and what I've seen engineers do is select the highest qualifications for both which tends to severely limit the pool of available contractors because if the contractor is or if the fabricator is the installer oftentimes they don't have the highest uh, qualifications for both so you have to be careful that you're not uh, limiting that pool I just finished a bid on a project for a new arena and by having that highest quality the contractor the uh, construction manager was only able to find one qualified fabricator and installer within the vicinity of the project so it can have some severe repercussions by trying to specify the qualifications now um, I want to ask you a, a trick question uh, when would you specify quali uh, installer qualifications for something like um, oh, uh, vinyl tile? Probably never. Why? When would you do it? Aha! <laughs> well, my point is that uh, Master Spec, which I'm more familiar with than the other systems, does in fact have install our requirements there. If you were doing a, I don't know, a, a, well, they don't put vinyl tile at schools anymore, they're mostly carpeted, but if you had a facility that was multi-floor and lots of rooms, you might want to think about that as opposed to most of my projects, which are uh, corporate uh, buildings where you only have it in uh, break rooms and, and uh, copier rooms and things like that. It's kind of overkill, but uh, those kinds of paragraphs are in some spec masters and so we need to think about that. If we don't specify the installer qualifications in effect we're leaving it up to the contractor and, uh, and we're relying on the contractor's skill, judgment and expertise to pick a good subcontractor. Well, but on the other hand, Lewis, if we're specifying a standard of care for the installation we've already set some level of expectation absolutely so, so you may you may not need the qualification statement now on the, another uh, thing that you f we find very common in master spec <coughs> is that whenever there is a standard paragraph for installer uh, qualifications there is also a corresponding paragraph under informational submittals requesting to see a copy, a written uh, statement of those qualifications. What do you think about that? Would you ever do that? Have you ever done that? Uh, have I done it? Yes. Um, and it goes back to the architect that wants every submittal imaginable. Um, my my concern is that we can specify the qualification where it's critical. If we're if we're going to specify it, we probably ought to verify that the that they actually do have the qualifications, and then the informational submittal probably becomes important. Uh, but if there's specific concerns as to why you're asking for the qualifications, then maybe spell out exactly what you need. Uh, to show that the contractor is actually qualified or the in fabricator or the installer. So I think we need to be judicious about how we're specifying the qualifications and we need to take some care to let the contractor know what we're expecting to prove that the installer or fabricator is actually qualified. Yeah, well, well, I was trying to make the point to uh, is that we can specify installer qualifications when needed, when that's really important and critical. Um, 
And when we do, we don't have to see necessarily a submittal for that. There may be, a, and I would use the, that, I would counsel everyone to use that very, very sparingly. It's just a waste of time for everybody, basically, for most things. But there may be a few critical things. Uh, you know, we're, again, you're doing a 30-story uh, building that's clad in curtain wall. You might very well want to see uh, some statement of the uh, installer qualifications. Well, and you may want to go back and think uh, military terms and think about mission critical. Yeah. And if it if it is something that is absolutely critical to the success of the project, then sure, go ahead and specify qualifications. If it's not critical, do a double take and really consider it carefully. Okay. Uh, let's say, Rob, do, um, do we have any hands up or other questions? Yes, I was just about to say, uh, we've had a hand up for quite some time. I believe Nina was looking to, uh, to speak up here. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now, Nina. You should be unmuted. Are you there? Hello, Nina. Oh, I'm sorry we put you off. Okay. Nina, <laughs> type your uh, question in and we can uh, try to address it. Oh, and actually, I, I see she does have a question uh, put on here. I think it's right at the top here. Uh, she says, regarding submittals, can you provide some discussion on submittals for action and submittals for information? I think that we probably need to, um, that's probably a good session. We might need to do a whole session or a half session on just on that subject, because it's a very important subject that if we process informational submittals like action submittals, there are some liability implications that uh, we need, that folks need to think about. But in short, in general, uh, action submittals are those where uh, we have to basically take, judge the content of the submittal to see, is it correct? Did the contractor understand? the uh, the intent of the drawings and specifications and are they complying with it. Whereas informational submittals are basically for record purposes only and the only thing one does is to look at them and say, yeah, they told me what I want and it's therefore responsive and you stick it in the file drawer or no, it's not responsive and you uh, ask them to redo it for that purpose. But you don't actually judge kind of the content as such like you do with a, an action submittal. Well, and the other thing, I believe the only commercial master out there using action and informational submittals at the moment is master spec. Yes. So that, that really becomes a almost a system specific discussion. All right. Um, let's uh, pick up some of the other questions. And, and I would thank you for that, Nina. And I think uh, David and I will talk about that offline. And, and uh, you might hear from us again on that subject, because I, I think it's something, the whole issue of processing submittals, uh, you know, although in, strictly speaking that's not specifying, we do need to support that part of CA with our written documents. And uh, we may need to, uh, and we certainly need to have a, a clear understanding of, of the implications of that. And so we uh, um, may want to uh, address that more fully in the future. Thank you. Uh, Rob, some others? Yep, some others. I've got another here from uh, Tom Gilmore. He states, uh, we handle what we call, quote, unquote, submittal creep by waiving submittals for basis of design products and separating submittals into categories such as pre-construction, subs for review, subs for info, but not returned, uh, lead, and closeout. And reviewing Division I requests on this helps contractors have correct expectation. Very good advice from Tom. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think that goes to the, he's talking about the basis of design submittals, and that's really what I was going to if you specify mm -hmm. it as basis of design. You don't need to review and, it. And also dividing the submittals uh, and clearly marking which ones are informational versus which ones are action submittals. 
Very good. Uh, next question. I, this is actually like a request from Seth Wiley. He's asking, um, can we talk a bit more about potentially various, quote, standards of care, um, like if such varying standards exist between architects, contractors, and owners? I'm not sure what you mean, Seth, and perhaps you could uh, raise your hand and uh, we could actually talk about that online, or if you would uh, submit a uh, supplementary um, explanation. Okay. Uh, I see t uh, And I see Tommy has a my good friend Tommy Smith has a question about qualification with respect to warranty. Um, I think Tommy's probably meaning that one of the reasons that you want to specify a, 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 a qualification requirement is if you're looking for an extended manufacturer warranty. Uh, years ago, I had the experience of um, specifying a, uh, a no dollar limit for you four-ply built-up premium roof for a branch bank. And uh, it turned out the subcontractor who installed it uh, was not actually authorized by the uh, manufacturer to do warranted installations. And so the GC actually had to pick up the warranty in that case because there was a warranty in, uh, um, specified. but. Uh, whenever you do have an extended manufacturer warranty, you probably need to put in a, a, a installer's qualification statement that they are, in fact, authorized by the manufacturer to do warranted um, installations. Okay. And I think that that's a point I'm reading some of the other comments jumping ahead, but Wayne Yancey was making the point that one of the ways master spec deals with uh, qualifications for installers is to require that they have workers that are trained by the manufacturer. And I think that goes to the point you were just trying to make, Lewis. OK. And Mr. Kirkpatrick has a question about addressing the coordination drawing submittals. Uh, again, I think um, all things considered that we really need to get into that in more detail uh, and approach that in a little more systematic manner. So uh, I think that's a really good idea for us to do a, a whole session on specifying submittals and, and what the implications are. Let's see. And uh, Mr. Antrella, Anatrella, I beg your pardon, uh, uh, comments that verifying field qualifications is very important for field welders. And yes, that is certainly the case. Uh, it's less critical for items that are uh, that a manufacturer fabricates, but if they're actually manufacturing the stuff on site with field welding, then you want to make sure that those guys uh, know what they're doing and have the right licenses and qualifications. Right, but that and that also goes back to a reference standard because we can rely on AWS that sets those standards. So. Uh, to qualify the welders and the welding procedures. So it's not, it's not something that's ambiguous like some of the requirements and years of experience or other arbitrary means of establishing qualifications. Yes, e exactly. There's some kind of certification like being a, uh, oh, let's say, certified construction specifier or certified construction contract administrator. Right. And I see from Seth uh, Wiley that he did, in fact, he says that we've already addressed his issues. So I guess we're ready, pretty much ready to go on to the next section. Right. Good Thank name there, uh, Seth. My uh, my third son is his name, Seth. Okay, but one more comment from Nina. And I oh, okay. Uh, she's commenting that section format yes. identifies both action submittals and informational submittals. And that's true. Uh, Section format also identifies just um, submittals. And action submittals and informational submittals become subheadings under the submittals heading. So you can actually choose to use action and informational 
or simply submittals. Yeah, I've I've been doing that for I guess about 15 years. I um, started um, breaking them up and actually put them in separate articles. Um, it makes it easier for the contractor to comply with the requirements, and it certainly makes it a lot easier for our uh, contract administration personnel to uh, to uh, process the submittals correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready to jump on? I think so, sir. All right. We're coming down to the end of where we left this uh, last presentation, so here you go. Okay. Oh, it's, it's back to me, actually. It is. Uh, adapting master specifications for my practice. Well, the, the two basic concepts here, and I'll talk about the first one, and that's pre-editing. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when you get the uh, updates from SpecTex, Master Spec, whomever, and, and most sections are on a you know three or four year update cycle. So when you get those in. Uh, be sure and just you can go through and if there are things that you just never use in your practice um, feel you know go ahead and delete those you might want to keep a an uncut version for reference purposes somewhere but for your working uh, copies go ahead and make those changes up front and and of course there may be some products that you like to use a lot uh, and you can that aren't even listed and that you can add in so you can do a lot of your editing up front rather than having to do it on each individual project the second thing is to put hard one experience into editing notes for yourself or for other users um, I, even when I was the sole specifier for a firm I would make myself notes about why you should pick one thing or the other and uh, when my the field representatives would come back with uh, war stories from their job site visits uh, I would try to incorporate some of those notes into my spec masters and there are ways that you can do that to make them non-printing or you can simply uh, We'll talk about that in the next part of our presentation when we're talking about uh, word processing techniques. There's a way to, if you uh, give those comments and that little information blocks as a separate style, you can pick all those styles and make them disappear when you get ready to print out the final version of the spec section. So. Pre-editing is one way, and the other way is to divide and conquer, David. Yep, and I like this approach, actually, because if you look at a lot of the master specifications, they become very broad scope in a lot of different kinds of products in a single section. The easiest way that I find to actually produce a construction spec is pick the right section first. So if I take the pre-edit concept and tailor the section to a more narrow scope uh, title, then I can simply pick the correct title and have most of the editing already done for the cons for the construction spec. It, um, it Give us some examples. Mm -hmm. what, what would you divide up? Well, masonry is a good one. Uh, <laughs> that It tends to have a lot of uh, different kinds of masonry and off, we will often have projects where the only concrete block masonry might be uh, foundation walls or might be uh, interior utility space partitions. So if we have a section that is just that single wide concrete block that we can pull that and it virtually unchanged be able to have that ready for a construction project. Uh, another one, because we do some uh, a good number of interior fit outs, would be the uh, hollow metal doors and frames. Yes. We, actu we actually split the frames and the doors 
because there are a number of projects that we do that don't use steel doors. That they have wood doors and steel frames. Correct. So there, just by making that initial split, uh, we'll have most of the editing already done. Now, when you have a project that has both steel doors and steel frames, you end up with an extra section. You might end up with a couple minutes extra editing. Long term, I think it's better to split them apart. I actually had to uh, split up uh, a resilient wall base from resilient tile flooring um, for that same reason, is that almost every project has a resilient wall base, even the ones that don't have any vinyl or rubber tile uh, for the floors in it. So I would do that as a separate one and then kind of try to edit by section rather than by uh, by the paragraph. Okay, and then one other example. Now, but um, yes, uh, we had a uh, specific question about this. Uh, Linton Stables asks or states, "I can see where the divide and conquer system helps the spec writer, but doesn't it make for a lot more paper?" I get really annoyed with MEP consultants who send me motors and motor starters. Does one ever come without the other? Ah, I think you, good question. <laughs> it, it, the, the question is, yes, it does result, as David has already said, in sometimes in some minor duplication of, of paper because you're, you're going to have, uh, in the case of <coughs> splitting up steel doors and frames, you're going to have to have submittals in both of those sections. All right. And maybe uh, even if the rest of the uh, section text would be different. So you, you can get into some minor duplications. The question is, what is faster and more efficient? A few extra sheets of paper in the project manual is not a big deal. Saving yourself uh, time, expensive time, is critical. And so it's a matter of what works. But another reason for dividing and conquer uh, David is going to tell you about has to do with fast track projects with multiple work packages. That was a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> you caught me by surprise there. Okay. Uh, but I, I would agree with you because oftentimes we end up getting uh, or we are required to submit specifications for the multiple work packages, fast track uh, delivery method. And you don't always know everything when you really are required to submit the a, a spec section. So if you end up with a narrower scope, you can probably tailor it and hit the scope better than you can if you end up with a broad scope, where there may be one item sort of hanging out there in the background that nobody has made a decision about, and then you're faced with, OK, do I delete just that one item that occurs in my master and end up creating another section just for that? Do I take a guess at it and hope that it's right? Or do I uh, just ignore it and leave it in and come back and revise it at some point later when, when I finally get a decision? So there is that kind of. Uh, one thing that I have started doing is um, splitting up the uh, glass section, the glazing section, uh, sometimes even into three sections. If you interior, do interior, exterior, and fire rated. Oh, I, well, that would make four. I was thinking of specialty interior glazing. You know, cast glass, patterned glass, oh, okay. the, that kind of stuff. But yeah, if you because the interior glass and glazing as opposed to exterior, not only are they different products, but they're even different installation requirements. And so uh, when you have multiple work packages, you're probably going to have one package that deals more or less with uh, the shell and core of the building, uh, and then another one that is kind of uh, the interior architecture. And then you might have a final one that deals with the more decorative interior uh, thing so that's that's one way of of uh, handling that uh, because otherwise you get into having to do 
uh, add, go back in and add stuff to an existing section you know, with underlining and strike through changes and so forth. And that gets hard to manage and it's hard to read. So it just makes it easier for everybody to divide those sections up and um, out, of, out of the spec masters. Yes, I still like narrow scope. So Linton, I'm sorry. Uh, I think a couple more pages in the spec book I don't think is a big deal. I actually try to tailor the specs down uh, to be pretty succinct and the, the architectural specs that we're producing are not voluminous even when we're using master spec. Uh, so we have I, a, I'm not overly concerned about the number of the page count. We have a comment from uh, Matt Short on that very subject. Uh, he says, uh, for your information, motors and motor starters are typically separate sections due to them being provided by separate suppliers, that is, a fan manufacturer and electrical supply house, and even separate contractors, Division 23 versus 26. Of course, in the above example, the fan manufacturer can provide both. Um, one of the things that I've always kind of envied the MEP uh, staff about is their is because most of their sections in master spec, and I assume in other spec masters, are much narrower in scope. And so they can go through and very, turn out their specs a lot faster simply because they pick the sections for the things that they need and leave out the sections for the things they don't need. Exactly. Edit by picking the right section. And we're done. OK. <laughs> I'm all for it. Uh, Rob, I see one hand raised. Do we, does, with Ken Moore? Yes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now, Ken. Are you there, Ken? Ken? Hmm. No. If we missed your question, could I'll, we'll scan back through it. I'll ask Rob to do that and see if we can find it. If not, if you could type it in, we'll be happy to try to address it. All right. Well, <clears throat> did we finish? I guess we did. I didn't do the rest of the spin it around. Oh, did you have? Uh, no, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't paying attention. I was just letting you talk. Okay. Well, we're going to have a little get together at the uh, convention. Uh, here week after next, uh, David and I, and you'll get to see why they refer to us as uh, faces made for webinars. Speak for yourself. <laughs> and um, Rob, why don't you tell the folks uh, when and where that's going to be? Well, that's actually going to be on the, is it the Tuesday, I believe? Uh, I think it's Friday, that? Rob. Is it the Friday? I do not actually have the room number yet. That's something we all okay. uh, need to discuss. No, well, yeah. Well, Lewis, when is your presentation? That's Wednesday afternoon, I think. Um, what David is alluding to is uh, I'm going to be a panelist on a, for a discussion group at one of the sessions on the future of specifying. And that's... That's Wednesday afternoon, but um. right. And then there's a reception for all of the practice groups immediately following. I think at 5:30 that day. That's right. So we you get a chance to uh, meet and greet us, and we would just love to uh, get to know some of you firsthand. Uh, we've had good conversations, uh, you know. Through the uh, web, the go-to meeting software here, and 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 we enjoy the exchange of ideas and and concepts and stuff, and we want to encourage that as much as possible. And if we get to meet some of you in person, I think that will facilitate our future communications. Right, and if if you're interested, Lewis is going to be presenting. I stuck him with this one uh, <laughs> because of scheduling conflicts at Hanley Wood, uh, but he'll be presenting a session on the future of specifications just ahead of that, 
and he'll be there with uh, the, the leaders from a couple of the other practice groups. Uh, so you'll be able to hear what is going on in it's the sustainability practice group and the BIM practice group, uh, along with Lewis's presentation on specifying practice group. So we invite you to, to come and attend that and meet us and greet us, and we'll be looking forward to seeing all of you. Uh, what I'd like to do is just ask of everyone that's online today if those that are attending the convention could just raise your hand so we could get a glimpse of who is going to be there. Wow, that's a pretty good sampling. We, we have about, what, 12, 14 or so? That's well, pretty great. good. Great. We look forward to meeting you all, all of you. Um, Next month, uh, we'd actually kind of hoped to get it started this month, but uh, it didn't work out. <coughs> Next month, uh, we've had a number of inquiries about just some of the uh, mechanics, the techniques of using word processing, that there are some tips and tricks that can greatly speed the process. And uh, David has just put up here a, a list of uh, some of the things that we thought we might talk about our basic outline. And what we're going to do is uh, David is actually going to uh, have some sample documents up on the screen and try to show you hands-on uh, how we can do things, some keyboard uh, shortcuts using macros, uh, using the outlining feature, um, auto te text and some of the other thing, common things that can greatly speed up the process. Um, when I started being a full-time specifier, uh, that was in the pre-computer days in 1982, and what we had to do was photocopy every page out of master spec, go through and uh, mark it up with red pencil and write insertions with the little diagrams and stuff and hand it to one of the uh, typists to transcribe with a typewriter to, to send it out. Um, I, I didn't start writing specs until about 1976, so that was after the, uh, the mimeograph area, but I do remember uh, that going on in the late 60s and 70s when I was working in architectural firms. But of course now, uh, uh, Many of us uh, are ten-finger people that can do a lot of our editing on screen, and maybe we just get uh, uh, some assistance from an administrative assistant to uh, do a little bit of cleanup and take care of some of the things like headers and footers. So uh, we can uh, anyway. That, that's our what we want to talk about next month, and we hope that we'll come up with some things that will be of. Uh, practical uh, help and assistance for you. Okay, and just looking ahead too, Lewis, we had talked maybe I'll do a quick convention wrap-up uh, next month too, and we have contacted a fellow named um, Leon Gorbati, who is developing a new specification uh, management and editing system, and he's planning on launching his product sometime this fall. Uh, we've invited him to uh, present to the group in December, uh, so it'll be an interesting uh, presentation, I think. If he's going to be showing us how he's using XML as the uh, tool to be able to manage and edit specifications and to be I able to do more than we can do in word processing. Good. One of these days, we need to start writing our specs with a... Uh, with a database rather than word pressing a thing all together, but that's a whole other session. Uh, a couple of folks have pointed out that um, the uh, sessions are actually on Thursday afternoon, not Wednesday, is, and uh, I just hope that uh, I remember that when I show up so that I'm at the right place at the right time. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else then? We're just about at the hour. Are there any more comments we need to address, Rob? 
Well, I was just going to say there was a question from Shane David. He was asking if registration is closed for Construct. And I, as I speak, I'm actually on the Construct website right now. And it says that online attendee registration is still open. So if you haven't registered, feel free to go ahead and do so. Yeah, we hope. OK, hope and I see that. Lee was asking about the XML presentation. Lee, that's going to be uh, planned for December. So I believe it's December 6th is the first Thursday in December. All right. And then, uh, OK, well, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, attending. And we really appreciate the questions and comments and encourage you to do more of that. Uh, we don't mind slowing down and restructuring our presentations, because our whole goal is uh, to try to facilitate a, uh, a discussion that will be of practical use to uh, our esteemed comrades in this noble endeavor of writing specifications. Wow, you make it sound so good, Louis. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much. I look forward to seeing everyone out at Construct. Uh, please do say hello if you see Lewis and I wandering around aimlessly. Um, we'd love to meet all of you and uh, get to know you. So thank you for joining us. And we're looking then at the, very, at the next meeting being October 6th. Same place, same time. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, everyone.